All right. Can I call you Bill? Sure. Thank you, Bill. The, um, I think some of the main things I really wanted you to talk about was uh, the, uh, the influence of, uh, on Sherwood Anderson's work of uh, Winsburg, Ohio. What, what okay. His main thing that he did, the reason everybody's still talking about him, is a book called Winesburg, Ohio. It's just not a place. It's just a fictional place where he wrote a series of stories and each one happened in Winesburg, Ohio. Now in his, in the format of it, like a street pattern and so on, comes from Clyde, Ohio, which is an actual place in Northwestern Ohio. But Winesburg is not a place. So it's a fictional place? Yes. And, and so, uh, only people who really study or read Sherwood Anderson would really know that it's I suppose so because there's been a widespread notion that he was trying to describe a town and he wasn't. He was simply writing stories which dealt with issues he was interested in and he put each one of them in Winesburg and when he thought of a town he says well he thought of the place he knew right this street and that street and the farm over here and you know all that. But he wasn't trying to describe any of the town. That was all incidental. Did but since the name is Winesburg, Ohio, people don't pay much attention. <laughs> Think that. Now, Winesburg, is it, uh, is it sort of a theme that runs throughout his novels or his works? No. Uh, well, it's the only uh, one of his works where that town occurs. And it's just, uh, just be, well, he, uh, another thing for you to know is that uh, people think that he's describing the people in the town of Clyde. Actually, he was living in Chicago, and his ideas for the characters that he wrote about came from what he observed in Chicago, which makes sense because the people are um, deviant people. They're people who are in a state of crisis there, and you're going to find those in a big city more than in a little town because the ones in a little town will leave and go to a big city where they won't be, you know, noticed so much and so on. So that's where he got his inspiration for his characters. And um, <coughs> he got his inspiration for his characters in Clyde. In, or in Chicago, Chicago. Writing about Clyde. Well, Clyde is simply the format. Right. You know, the, the, the street pattern and this and that. Now, it could have been a lot of other places, but the Clyde was where he had been, so, but naturally. I, uh, I did research in Clyde, talked to people in Clyde, and someone said, well, that's my uncle that ran the bank. No, no such thing. They didn't know. That just seemed like it. it was like somebody that was in there and that they had known, but there was no effort on his part to depict uh, people in, in Clyde. The, um, so, uh, I guess, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, but uh, it would seem to me then if you, if you started with a fictional town mm -hmm. and uh, you wrote about characters that you might have, or not, might have known or not known mm -hmm. in life, then, then it would almost be necessary to have a fictional town to set it all in. Well, I call it a frame to hang the stories on. So you have to have some place to, to put them. Now remember this, the stories were not written as a book and then published. One was published here, and one was published there, and one was published over there, and eventually a series of them collected, and a publisher said, well, I'll do a book for you, and of course, that's what everybody wants, and uh, so he said, well, we might as well call it Winesburg, Ohio, because that's where all these things supposedly happen. So that sort of accumulated itself into uh, existence, but most people who read the book have no idea of the things that I'm telling you. Is there any history to called it Winesburg? No, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I wondered about that, and I tried to think, you know, where do you get this idea from? I think there is a Winesburg somewhere uh, on the map, not in Ohio, but I just uh, think the, I think the name just appealed to him for some, you know, how that might be. The, um, in Elyria, is that Elyria. 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 Yes. I keep wanting to say Elyria. Because, I know. But that's, that's you that's should, because the guy's name was Eli, but that's not what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> so in, um, 
What about and they they asked him to ask about Anderson's breakdown in Ohio. Yes. That, yeah. That's so he's Hillary, you're Hill. saying. Yes, he he had amnesia. He left his town. He had a business there. He walked out of Illyria, which is 30 miles from Cleveland. Three days later, he showed up and went into a drugstore and said, I wonder if you can help me figure out who I am. And he had an address book. And the druggist knew one of the people in his address book, called him up, and a guy came and rescued him, took him to the hospital, and he went back to Illyria. So he had amnesia. Was that from a, a physical condition? Or? No, that's a mental condition. He, he basically... I mean, he wouldn't hit on the head or No, no, no. no it's, it's not physical. He, now he was a guy that had hardly any schooling. He had one year at Wittenberg Academy and had not graduated from high school. He was good enough that somebody saw him there and uh, took, him to Chicago, took him to Chicago to be in advertising business. Okay, if you're in the advertising business, you're trying to convince people to buy stuff whether they need it or not, right? So he was using his linguistic skills for that purpose. Well, I bothered him, and it continued to bother him, and he, but he still had to live, and so uh, basically his um, income was from advertising. He got to be so good that he could uh, work for six months and then take six months off to write and still come back. Most places won't let you do that, but he was good enough to do it. Okay, and uh, in Illyria, he had a business. And being in business and coming up with all this crap bothered him so much that uh, he had a, he had three days of, of lapse. Well, then he recovered. So he had a lot of internal turmoil. Yes, and, and uh, internal turmoil is the business of the characters in Winesburg, Ohio. Not necessarily the things that were wrong with him, but he was interested in them and depicting them because of his own inner turmoil. We are getting somewhere now, and then, then, um, and you know, I've heard it said once that um, writers don't, even though they write fiction, they don't necessarily write fictitious things about fiction. They write from internal experience. I used to tell my students, look for the psychic wound. If somebody writes thirty novels, there's something inside that's impelling. I mean, especially if they're serious books, not just ones that you're trying to sell for like candy. Uh, there's something bothering them about life that they're trying. It's playing it out. When you're putting all these characters together and all these events together, you're saying, well, how would this be? And does this work? And is this what life is? And, and of course, you're trying to earn a living. If you make the mistake of trying to earn a living by writing, then you sold yourself down into slavery, so to speak. But the, And that creates a problem, too, because you write your heart out, and then the publisher says, well, so I can't use this, you know. There you are. And Anderson only wrote one really good seller. The Weinsberg was not an especially good seller. It just happens to be a landmark book. He wrote that book. The book was published in 1919, and the stories were written in the, say, the four or five years before that. Uh, Sigmund Freud was published in this country in 1915. The country was beginning to get the notion of psychiatry and uh, mental health and all of that sort of thing, and he was right in that. So that he is a landmark book in the history of American literature, and if you pick up any anthology of American literature, you are going to have a representation of Sherwood Anderson, mainly because of the book, Winesburg, Ohio. His other books do not come up to that level. But that's, that's the peak of his contribution to what serious people think of as uh, American literature. Yes. And um, why do you suppose it was his peak? I mean, can you analyze that? Enough? Well, I think that these, the issues, as they call them today, were very serious to him. Uh, he was trying to work his way through them in these stories, and perhaps to some extent, it enabled him to come to terms with them. Uh, but after that, after he became famous, which he was in the 20s, he was about one of the several most famous American writers. Well, then a lot of other things started to come in, and you have to do this and do that. And uh, uh, he, among other things, they, somebody got with him and wanted him to make a, 
a play out of Winesburg, Ohio, and it simply wasn't a play. And they had to put a piece, take a piece off here and put something else in here, and you were doing something else. You were writing plays, not writing your heart out, you were writing your plays. And so the last thing that he did, uh, he died in 1941 in March in uh, the district of uh, the Canal Zone. And the, he was on a ship going to South America, and he evidently got peritonitis. They took him off the ship, and nobody knew what to do, and he died. But what was he doing? He was going to South America, and he thought that he could go to South America and interview people in little towns and write another Winesburg, which was asinine. I mean, it was just a desperate notion that had no basis of any kind and anything at all, but that's what he was doing. So he still was trying to get back up to to what he had had in Winesburg. Uh, yeah, another th wild thing that he did, uh, he made a lot of money with a book called Dark Laughter, a lot of money for him anyway, and he built a house. And he moved to Marion, Virginia, and he bought two newspapers. One was a Republican newspaper and one was a Democratic newspaper. And the people all over the country knew this. It was a publicity thing. And so, but that's about as far as, uh, from writing your heart out in Winesburg, Ohio, as you can get. But he, this was just a making, making a living sort of thing. Incidentally, I told you that he had an amnesia attack. And he walked over and came back. Well, that was publicized as he just got fed up with the business world, and he walked out and went out. But no, he didn't. He got sick, and he, he had an attack and came back, and he went back to advertising. He went back to the advertising business because that's what he knew. That's what he knew of, but uh, it was almost a vicious cycle. Then, yeah. not being too cliche, he was he was experiencing all the uh, the stress and anxiety of society, which was making him write better in mm -hmm. a life that he hated. Mm -hmm. but it was making him successful in the life that he sought. Yeah, well, that's not a peculiar situation. The miracle is that he came out with a book that still is considered to be one of the exceptional books of the 20th century. And if you think of, I don't know how much study of literature you've done, but if you take just one person and study everything that there is to know about it, you say, wow, look at that. How did that happen? You know, all kinds of wild things happen. But it takes, yeah, that's right. It takes, it, it, that's like you said, when he was going to South America trying to duplicate his, yeah. his success. Or he didn't even know Spanish, I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. But the crazy thing is, is uh, just like, you know, like you're pointing out, is that he, um, Everything in the universe had to be perfect for him to write one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it was like he was never going to find that. No, it was just one of us. Kind of one of us. One. Well, if you write one wonderful book, you can say, "Wow, was I lucky?" <laughs> <laughs> or you know, you can't expect that kind of perfection in your life. There's always something. Most of us live uh, on a plane that something. Well, I, I I think about fame. Fame is not necessarily a good thing. Now he had a fair amount of fame because, as I say. He was one of the best known writers in America in the, 20, in the 1920s. A woman sat next to him in, at a, a dinner in Boston. And, and I, if you read Winesburg, Ohio, and I do recommend that, there's a great deal of pro concern with sexual problems. So she said, she wrote to him afterwards, she said, I sat next to you at dinner and I'll never be clean again. <laughs> People thought he was a terrible guy for uh, really documenting some of the things that sex can do to people. And of course, that's in every day's newspaper. Back then, though. But, well, it, it's just the same. It's in every day's newspaper. I just read yesterday about a guy that you know, he had, he killed a lot of women. There was, there was a woman who was a, a poodle groomer. They found her, they found her car. They never found her. He just captured her and beheaded her and this and that. All basically sexual, weird, but uh, anyway, that if you read Weinsberg, Ohio, you'll see that's that's really bothering him. It's probably a not uh, the only thing that bothered him, but that was. Right, it's probably a real fine line between insanity and genius. Isn't it? I don't know. I don't know whether I think that or not. I don't think you have to be crazy to be a genius or or even be crazed, but uh, it is it is peculiar. To be an author is peculiar. It's peculiar to be a professor, as far as that goes. But I'm still pretty normal, I think. Uh, I always intended to be. Uh, but uh, 
Anderson is just one of those extraordinary people who produced something exceptional. And I'm very lucky that I happen to be able to know something about him. You spent your whole life studying him. No, I didn't. Until 1940. Not well, I today. know, but that just went. <laughs> I spent 40 months in the army. I didn't get oh, a chance to do a whole lot of study oh, during that period. I bet you didn't. I bet you. <laughs> he's I mean, been you spent a majority of your life. He's been somebody. Well, I studied other people besides that. Why were you so infatuated with his work? I read uh, the American Literature Anthology. I'm taking a course. Two stories. I'm, I want to know why, and I'm a fool. And I said, "Who wrote this?" You know. Who is the person who I got? was interested? Don't ask me why I was. They struck me. And later, when I was, uh, as a doctoral candidate, told uh, that I'm going to do a dissertation, and I said, well, that's what I'd like to study, so then you might like this story. I, I said, okay, I want to do my dissertation on Sherwood Anderson. Believe it or not, what they said was, well, he isn't even dead yet. And I, you know, I had, to I had to control myself to keep from giving my opinion of that. The next week, believe this or not, I picked up the paper and he was dead. So I went back and I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you satisfied now that this man is dead? And so uh, that's... What a great story. <laughs> well, well I, I experienced that. That <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> I didn't laugh at the time, no, I might I tell you, you didn't. but I, I laughed when I saw him. I said, oh, my God, there he has gone and died for me. But he didn't even know me, of course. <laughs> um, did some of the things, uh, uh, did, let's see, uh, a mosaic of imaginative life. Of yeah, Anderson. yeah. And that's uh, cause this is uh, from, from uh, some of the stuff that you wrote, right? Well, this is uh, in my book, Winesburg, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Before each chapter, I had maybe 10 or 20 quotations from Anderson, and each one was a mosaic, so you could, if you wanted to, you could say, well, he said this, and he said that, and he said that, and you could kind of get a filtering into your consciousness from what kind of a guy this was, just as if you talked to me for a hundred times, you'd begin to get a notion of what I was like. But that's what those, like, each stone is for a mosaic. You've seen mosaics, of Absolutely. course. So and each together they make a whole. Yeah, and they give you an idea. My notion was I wanted to um, provide an opportunity for somebody to know what Anderson was like in case they wanted to know, like I did. And, uh, and this, that's what this helps to do. The, um, is there anything else that you can think of? What, what is William Anderson, how could you, um, I'm sorry, not Sherwin Anderson, excuse me, um, I'm looking at your name and seeing his. Maybe I, may, maybe I misspoke on purpose. <laughs> the, um, how, how would you think that some of the lessons or some of the stories that are from the days of Winesburg, Ohio, and some of the classic literature of that time reflect on some of the events that are going on today? If you had the kinds of problems that they had in those stories, you could go to the local mental health and get some help. If you went, you know, maybe you wouldn't go. I mean, we're still reading about people who are doing these terrible things, but there is a great deal more consciousness and understanding of mental health today than there was then. And I don't want you to think I think he was responsible for that. I'm just saying that's the change that has happened. And I mentioned to you before that Freud was just beginning to be known. We now have psychiatrists. And uh, you can go to a psychiatrist or you can go to a mental health counselor or whatever. And you can get help if you want to. But those people didn't have a clue that he wrote about. They just didn't have a clue. And I think that bothered him. I don't know uh, just exactly whether he was saying, gee, I wish somebody would be able to help these people or anything like that. But uh, the fact remains that the problems that he depicts so vividly and effectively don't have to happen today. But they do, of course. Uh, we read about them every day. But maybe there are fewer. Because this is a much bigger and more crowded country uh, today than it was 60 years ago, or seven, 80, make it 80. Uh, the, 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 in other words, it's what you can see is a part of the growth of this country, and of course, still has lots of problems. We all know that. But uh, he cared about that, and it mattered to him. And uh, inside himself was, uh, well, I say he was exercising ghosts. 
uh, not real ghosts, you know, but uh, ideas and situations and kinds of people that bothered him. That uh, when you think, I'm a, I'm a human here. Here we are, this ball is going around and around out in space. And uh, I'm just sitting here, uh, not really worrying too much about it. But uh, we have billions of people, some of whom are in a terrible state of crisis, and uh, that he depicts those very well. I should think anyone at all who is in a mental health business should read Winesburg, Ohio, because he did a beautiful job of depicting those things. So I guess you could too, and then this will be the last thing, um, but 80 years ago or not, people were basically the same. Oh yes, they, they've they've been, been they they're just the same in the Garden of Eden. I'm not kidding. They were one killed the other, you know. Sibling rivalry. God told them to do this, and he said, "No, we're going to do that." <laughs> so that's uh, the Bible. I'm not much of a one for saying belong to this religion or that or the other, but the Bible rewards study because it has so much human nature in it. So many incidents where you say, yeah, I know that situation. If you read it that way, instead of thinking it's God's word, that the religion has to be this way or that, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, and, and a, a wonderful compilation of human interest factors. And many, many, many authors have thought that. And there's one story in Winesburg which is based directly on a biblical episode. I so he, he, he was quite aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's a, to talk of the Bible is... Well, I'm just, I started on that because the they started being that way as soon as they... And we don't even know when we started to have humans. You know, there's a lot of speculation. Well, there's probably never been a book in the history of mankind that had more an influence on the human race than the Bible. And then so yeah, every well, author had to be... Well, that. that's what we, we Christians think, but the Islamics think so. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm talking about yeah. sexual, sexual yeah. books. Well, it, it's, uh, it certainly has had an effect, yeah. no question. Not enough, unfortunately, because they're still killing each other. Nobody ever listens to all of us. You <laughs> what, uh, if there's anything that you could say to sort of wrap uh, everything <laughs> up, um, what would it be? I just have to say that I feel I was very fortunate that I happened to encounter Sherwood Anderson, and it's uh, the experience that I had in attempting to find out what he was like had just been an embellishment to my life, and I appreciate it. We didn't say anything about the letters that he, that I found 308 unpublished letters. Oh, you did? Oh, yes, and it's in one of my, in my other book. Uh, he, well, let's on talk about those. What well, kind of insight did you gain from them? Well, um, most of what I know about how the uh, Winesburg Ohio was written I got from that because the woman to whom he wrote them, uh, they were lovers and then they became friends. And when he was writing the stories, he'd send her a copy when he did one of the stories. There was that, that close a relationship. And she said he went camping and his tent burned down and uh, some of the stories were burned and he asked her for a replacement story. So she's that close, right? So uh, he told her about uh, getting his characters from Chicago, which I mentioned to you earlier. And more important yet, he wrote us, when I started to work on him, uh, there were three autobiographies, all of which were heavily fictional. And so, of course, I'm a fact person. And so I was correcting him a lot of what he said all the time. And in these letters, uh, he was very frank. Instead of writing things that he thought would be interesting to to sell and be, in, uh, you know, that sort of thing. He, he was uh, uh, just telling her what it was what. So he had quite a, quite a batch of 308 letters of information about him. So that's the importance of those letters. Yes, sir. Hi. I didn't want to interrupt you, but <laughs> oh. I see you're feeling okay today. Huh? Yes, yeah. Nice Good. to see you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Well, can I take a few pictures of you? Yes, sir, it is.